All right, welcome back again. Uh, we're going to get the show on the road. Coming to you today from space. As I'm recording this, Richard Branson's trying to be the first uh, billionaire in space. But I beat you here, Richard. So now all I need to do is take your money so I can be a billionaire. Then I would be the first billionaire in space. Whatever. Anyway, back to what we were discussing. We need to talk about your outline and your evaluation form. So let's scroll down till we find that. And here is where that begins. Now, what you'll notice here is that you've got the outline and evaluation form that's blank. This is the outline that you're going to use to make your speeches, all right? So um, whenever we do a speech, we're going to use this, this outline format. And you can literally, please don't change this, copy it, paste it into a new Word doc and start filling it in, okay? That's what I want you to do with this particular um, sheet as you make your outlines for these speeches. Now, um, what you'll see next is the same outline, but now the red text is telling you basically what each of these things uh, is and does. And so I'm going to walk you through this just briefly today so that you can see what goes where and why it's so important that we have everything. And I do want to just sort of jump back on your screen for a second and let you know this outline is made in a way that allows you to have everything you need without having to really worry too much about where to put it. Now, um, just as a quick background, the outline and the evaluation form you're going to use, I came up with these. but not just sort of out of nowhere. So when I was teaching at East Tennessee State University a while back, um, part of my job at, at one point was to come up with a standardized outline and grade form for public speaking courses across the state of Tennessee. And um, I was on a team who had to do that. And this is the final result. And so it worked well. The whole state, as far as I know, still uses it. Um, and we're going to use it mainly because it is very, in my opinion, useful and helpful to you because it's got everything you need in the order that you need it. You don't need to take out anything. You don't need to add in anything. You don't need to rearrange anything. You just roll with it. Then what you will see, and let me shrink myself a little, is the evaluation form, which is built from the outline. So some speech instructors, professors will divide up the grade on speeches differently. So some will say that it's, you know, 80% uh, content, 20% delivery. Some are 70, 30. I'm more of a 50, 50 guy. Um, I, I realize that the content is extremely valuable, but I also know that even if you take a wonderful, the best speech ever, I have a dream speech, and then have it delivered by you know a child who's just learning to talk, it loses all of its its real meaning. And so I think it's equal parts content and delivery. And that's how this is reflected in the grade form. Also what you'll see, and we'll, I'll go through this sort of step by step with you, is that most of the stuff here, at least in the first four elements, are all about your preparation. So this is what you would do in your outline and your work before the speech starts. Then you've got your uh, next items, five, six, and seven, which are all about during the speech and your delivery. And then eight is a bit of a combination. And so I will walk you through all of this as we go. All right, I'm going to move myself here. And then I'm going to just kind of I'll switch back and forth between the, the blank and the red text so that we can all be on the same page. But the first thing I'll draw your attention to is the idea that a speech, just like an essay, is going to have three main parts, your introduction, your body, and your conclusion. And you see those big bolded headings here, introduction, body, and conclusion. So those are your three big chunks. Now, for an introduction, different, again, approaches are out there in terms of what goes into an introduction and what order. For us, I think this is the most important type of information you can put in an introduction and I like it in this order. Um, so let's look at what is going on in this outline. 
So first things first, you see the attention getter is the very first thing that you will say. You see it here, start speaking here. This is just for bookkeeping, your name, topic, and purpose. But when you get to attention getter, this is where we will really begin speaking. Now notice, before we move on, that you've got yourself in topic introduction where you say your name and your topic. It's in there, but it's after the attention getter. So from here on out, whether it's in this class or any other time you're giving a, a presentation or a speech, a talk, do not, please don't, start with, hi, my name is, and today I'm gonna to tell you about. That's played out, it's tired, it's not, it's not working. Um, sometimes people will turn you off just from your name and your topic. And so we wanna put that second. You know, if it's a topic they just don't think they care about, they're not going to listen anymore. Uh, your name, right? It could be the fact, maybe they don't like your name. Maybe they used to date someone with your name. Maybe um, they're still hung up on that person. Oh no. And now all they're thinking about is that other person or the person who they used to know with your name, but they can't quite remember who they were. Or God help you if you have a name like mine, Carl, right? And so now you're thinking of God, the kid from The Walking Dead and the Caddyshack guy and the llamas that kill people and uh, Sling Blade. I mean, Carl Winslow from Family Matters or Family Ties. Like, it, it's just, ugh, ugh, right? So you don't want to give them any reason to start being distracted too soon. That's why we'll start with the attention getter. So as we go down to this other one, You'll see here that the attention getter should be the first thing you say, and you, you have options on how you might go about grabbing people's attention. First of all, understand it's vital that you do this. You have to get their attention before you can keep it, and you want to keep their attention. That's the only way to actually inform or persuade someone is if they hear what you're saying. Shocker, I know. Um, but you have options. You could use things like a shocking statistic. Now, Let's say this speech is on STD awareness and we want uh, the, the audience to go and get checked for STDs. Well, one attention getter might be that one in four people in this class, one in four of you watching right now, has an STD, whether you know it or not. That's true. That's a true fact, right? You can cite that. And so if I say that one in four... It can make people very uneasy. Maybe they didn't realize it was that high. Maybe, um, you know, they thought, oh, you know, it's it's very rare. No, it's it's one in four and probably going up pretty quick, um, especially after everybody's back out on campus as a release from COVID. Mm, yeah, be careful out there, Chief. So with this, um, we could do that shocking statistic. If just saying one in four is not enough, we could take it a step further. We could say to the the audience, you know, look to your left. Look to your right. Look to either in front or behind you. Now think about yourself. Who is it? There's four. Is it you? Are you sure? Right? So that's going to get some people's attention. So anytime you can use some sort of a shocking number that they can really just sort of blow their mind with, you know, you could, you could tell them about how much something costs, how many people are affected by something. You've got lots of options. Uh, but make sure that it applies to your topic and that it's going to grab that audience. Now, sometimes if you say, you know, this costs over $2 billion, it doesn't mean much to people because they can't visualize $2 billion. I mean, that's just, you know, it's not something that's very common. So, you know, if you wanted to do some math on that and you could say, you know, this is costing $2 billion, or in other words, if you made $100,000 a year, it would take you 200,000 years or more. I, forget, I don't know the math on that one. But, you know, that's that's another way to visualize for us to think about it in a way that connects back that we're able to really identify with as opposed to just these big abstract numbers that are just sort of, you know, they feel almost made up, you know, but they're they're real. So shocking factor statistic is nice. Questions can be very good, too. Um, there's right and wrong types of questions. Now, since you are doing recorded presentations without a live audience, your best bet is to ask rhetorical questions. So questions, these are questions that don't really want an answer. They're just designed to make people think. So you might throw something out there like, um, what if I told you that one in four of you have an STD in the room, right? Now you're phrasing it as a question. You're not 
really waiting for someone to say how they would feel or what their thoughts would be. You just, what if I told you this? Don't just immediately move on. Pause. Let that sink in. What if I told you that one in four of you has an STD? Would you believe me? Well, you should. Because according to, and then you could cite that information. All right, so that's one, another way to get attention is through those questions. If you have a real audience, a live audience, you could do show of hands questions. I think those are great. Um, you know, raise your hand if you've ever done this. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Do not ask real questions that ask for verbal responses. What can happen there is you might hit someone who doesn't want to say anything. They give you a one word answer and it doesn't quite fit with your, your plan in your head. Or you might find someone who just wants to keep on talking and talking and talking. Meanwhile, you're in a time limit. So you don't really want to risk that either. So rhetorical questions, show of hands questions for a live audience are good. But otherwise, that's that's about as far as you want to go with questions. Now, you may have a topic that can use humor as part of the introduction. If that's the case, go for it. If, if you're funny and it's appropriate. How do you know if you're funny? Well, if you're questioning it right now, you're not. Let's just face it. If you tell a joke and you laugh more than the other people around you, no, you're, you're, you're probably not. If you tell a joke and you have to start it over more than one time, you, you're not funny, right? So, so stay away from humor if you don't feel comfortable using it or if your topic isn't really um, appropriate for it. I've had people seriously give a speech one time on um, cancer and they started out with what did one tumor say to the other? Now, I'm the type of person who finds that most things in life can be funny. Um, I think if you don't laugh, you know, you're really missing out on on life in a lot of ways, even in terrible times. But I, I have to admit, when I heard that one, it was actually while my mother was going through cancer treatment. She's fine now, thank God. But, you know, it was sort of, it hit me the wrong way. I really wanted to jump up and smack the person. Um, like, how can you laugh at this? But then I thought, wow, that's really too personal but it didn't go over well with the audience. So, you know, you want to be careful with your use of humor. Make sure that you can do it and that it fits. Now, the other type of attention getter that is really useful, and I really like it, especially for uh, the persuasive speeches, is going to be a story. Um, humans love stories. We're, we're natural storytellers. Before we could write, we were telling stories to learn, to teach. And so it's something that's just a big part of who we are as, as creatures. Now, when you're thinking about using a story for a speech, you've got a few options. You know, you can start out with a story that is real if you, if you have one. If it's about you, even better. However, uh, that's not always the case. Some of us don't have stories about, you know, um, thinking of topics that have come up from you guys uh, over the past week. But, you know, if you're going to talk about um, the homeless population, you know, and you don't have a personal story about being homeless, uh, which is, you know, thankful, uh, you, you don't want to make one up about yourself. Now you can make up stories. Hear me. You can make up stories. They can be completely fabricated, but you can't say that they're true. Those are called hypothetical illustrations, fake stories. Um, and, and this is something that you can, <clears throat> you can get creative with, but make sure that you're giving like the characters names and you're being descriptive and it's more than just sort of a skeletonized version of a story. Um, you know, uh, probably one of the best people that have I've seen do this is former President Obama, who would talk about legislation that he wanted to see happen and then give stories. I don't know if they were true or not um, about Americans who were affected by this legislation. So when he was trying to push for welfare reform, he didn't, well, he, he gave a story about a woman he had met with her two daughters, um, but he didn't just say it that way. You know, if he would have said, hey, I met a woman, she's working real hard, two jobs, got two daughters, but still they struggle. And it's just not fair to those little girls or the woman. So we need to fix this. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe some people were like, oh yeah, we got to remember that. But most people didn't really care. But instead of just doing that, he made it a full on story. And so it was, you know, I was in this location and I met a, a woman named, I'm making it up, Amber and her two kids. 
Lady in Gaga, we'll say. Um, and her two daughters were just lovely. They looked just like their mom. And you could tell that they were a very tight knit group there. And, you know, Amber was telling me about how she worked two different jobs and that she still sometimes had to choose between food and rent. And, you know, it broke my heart because those two little girls, Lady and Gaga, you know, they don't deserve that with the mother working so hard and on and on and on and on and on. And so you see the idea there is to get the audience sort of drawn into a story. They forget what the topic is because they don't know yet in your speech, but they're drawn in. doesn't matter. They're just listening. And then you can hit them with, and here's my topic. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one other way to do it. Again, personal stories are great. Made up stories are fine. As long as you don't tell us they're real or imply they're real. Now, where they fit, think about this a little bit. So if you start with a story, here's the way you should, you should do this big picture, no matter what you use for your attention getter right here on the screen, you should also use it for your closure. That's the last thing on the outline. So the first and the last should be the same. Now, the way that would work if this was a statistic is, you know, one in four of you have an STD. Who is it? Look around the room, blah, blah, blah. Then at the end, I could come back and say, so at the beginning, I told you one in four of you has an STD. Have you figured out who it is yet? Are you completely certain that it's not you? If you are, how do you know? Have you been tested? Because if you haven't, you can't know. You should get tested, right? And so now I can finish up sort of where I began. If it's a story and we're talking about, you know, Amber and her two daughters, they were working full time, but uh, two jobs full time uh, struggled still. And one day Amber got two bills. She had her rent and she had her, um, I don't know, medication, doctor's bills. And she couldn't pay both. She could only pay one. And she struggled. She sat and struggled about which one to pay. Hi, my name is, and then you can get into the speech. So you may be wondering from the beginning, was Amber able to pay both of her bills? No. Which one did she pick? And then you kind of finish the story from there. So start a story, stop it at an interesting point, give the speech, and then finish the story at the end. That can really work well. Um, the best example I've ever heard of this personally was at a speaking competition um, in Tennessee. I used to coach forensics and debate, and I was judging this final round for the state championship. And a guy came in and he was talking about his speech was on truth and personal truth, religious truth and scientific truth. And so he starts out with this story. I mean, it's something along the lines of like there was an eight year old boy and he and his parents immigrated to America to chase the American dream. Um, in order to do this, his father and mother both, both worked two jobs as, as often as they could. And the boy spent a lot of time home alone. Um, well, one day he noticed that the neighbor had a rusted out lawnmower in his backyard. And so he saw the neighbor out one day and he walked over and asked if he could um, borrow that lawnmower. And the guy said, yeah, the kid, the lawnmower doesn't even work. And he said, well, if I can fix it, can I use it? And the, the old man said, you know, if you can fix it, you can have it. And so he took it home, and when his dad had some free time, they both worked on it together, and they finally got the thing working. Well, the little boy wanted to chip in to this American dream idea, so he decided to mow lawns, um, and he's mowing one day, and it's so hot, and he can't wait to get finished to go to the little pool down the street, but he turned that lawnmower to make one final pass and put it back down on the ground, and when he did, he heard a loud pop, he fell to the ground, and he felt pain in his right leg. He looked and his foot was missing. The blade had come out of the back of the mower and severed his foot at the ankle. The boy screamed, and the neighbor came out, and picked him up, grabbed his foot, took them to the hospital where the mother met them. And the doctor said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be able to save your son's foot. In fact, we need to remove most of his leg in case there's been an infection. And his mother said, this can't be true. And then he stops, and he's, okay, here's truth, 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 truth. So then at the end, um, you're probably wondering what happened to the little boy, do you think? Uh, well, the mother asked for a second opinion, and she got one. This doctor came with a very different story. He said that he would not only be able to keep the leg attached, but he saw no signs of infection, and if she wanted to, he could reattach the boy's foot. They knew that he would never have full use of it again, but he would be complete if that's what his mother wanted, and she did. And then the speaker steps out, and he's like, and I'm so glad my mother did that for me those years ago because I'm still standing on my own two feet in front of you today. 
Everybody lost it, right? Except for me. I thought he was lying. I thought he made it up. And so it's a true story. I asked him to show me his ankle and he sort of looked, everybody was looking at me like, what are you, how evil are you? And I, it was a violation of rules if he lied. So sure enough, he showed me his ankle and he had the scar all the way around. So, I mean, you know, oops. Um, I walked out, they never invited me back, but the idea here is what you see at the very end and it's ring structure. It's you start somewhere, you keep going, you deliver the whole speech and you finish right back where you started, like the face of a clock, 12 to 12. And so when you do that, your audience feels as though you've come what's called full circle, right? Uh, and they like that they feel complete. So Long way of saying your attention getter is so important. That's why I spend so much time on it right here because it is the very first thing and it does a very important job that if it doesn't get its job done, the rest of this is less effective. But after you grab their attention in some way, introduce yourself and your topic. Then you see it here, the statement of purpose. By the end of this speech, you should, and I want you to say those words. So here, by the end of this speech, you should. Know more about this topic. Agree with this topic. Take the position of if this is persuasive. But for an informative speech, it should simply be know more about, be more informed about, um, better understand, whatever it is. And then your topic. That's it. It's plug and play. By the end of this speech, you should know more about, understand better, yada, 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 your topic. That's it. Then you've got the thesis statement and the central idea. Now, before we get too deep on this, I'll say two things. One is that you should do this dead last because the second thing is that this is a single sentence summary of everything. And it's hard to summarize things if you're just on the third item on your outline. So let that one go, but don't forget to come back to it and fill it in. And we're going to talk later about how to do that effectively. Then for the relevant statement, this is where you say to your audience, you should care about this topic because I want you to say those words again. You see them right there and then tell us why the audience should care about your topic. And you need to give us two reasons why, um, you know, so if it's the STD speech, it's because it can affect you. Obviously, it's your health um, and your, your entire, you know, sexual life can be thrown off if, you know, something's something's wrong here. Um, you don't want to spread things around. So, you know, thinking about the relevance is very important. Come up with at least two reasons. If you can't, that's not a good sign about the topic. But I think, I know all of you have topics that will work, at least the people that turned them in. And so with those, you're going to be able to come up with a couple reasons here. Um, I'm just thinking of one or two, um, uh, like the homelessness one again. Some people may think that doesn't affect me. It's not relevant to me because I'm not homeless and chances are I won't be. And I don't want you to stretch and say, well, you never know, though. You could be one day. Yeah, but that's still not going to get most people to care. I think what you could say is, you know, we're all humans. And when humans are suffering, we, we should all suffer. We should all feel that pain. And your tax dollars in some ways are going to deal with the homelessness issue so shouldn't you care about how it's being dealt with since you're paying for it? I mean, that, that seems to make more sense to me. Then the next thing you'll see is the preview of main points. This is where you're going to just label your main points, give them a name or a brief phrase and present them to us. First, I'll tell you about this. Then I'll tell you about that. Then I'll tell you about the next thing. That's it. That's all you need to do there. It's a numbered list. What you'll see is that you're going to preview your main points here. Then when you get to the body, you see them again, main point one, main point two, main point three. Then as you get to the conclusion, you'll see it here. Relist the main points again in the review of the main points. Now, this sounds repetitive and it is. The saying in speech world is that a good speaker will tell you what they're going to tell you. <clears throat> They'll tell you and then they tell you what they told you. And that built-in repetition helps us remember what was said in a way that we wouldn't otherwise. You know, in a paper or a book, we can flip back and forth and remind ourselves of what was there. We can't do that in a speech. And the audience doesn't want to stop you every couple minutes and say, what, what did you say a second ago? And, and ask for being reminded. So this way, the more you can repeat it, at least these three big times, 
the, the clearer your content is likely to be for that audience. They're going to connect with it better. They're going to, to understand it better because it's, it's repetitive. It's sort of driven home. But that is your full introduction. And then the last thing here, sort of between the introduction and body, is a transition where I want you to use a signal word. And that could be to begin or for starters. You could say to jump off or to take take off or to get this thing started, to whatever you want to do. There's not really a, a wrong sort of signal word there as long as it's just that, a signal word that we are now starting the body of the speech. All right, so that's what we're looking for with that transition. Next up, you have the body. You're going to have three main points. Three, not two, not four, three. Three main points. Um, and those are going to be listed just like this. Now, uh, here you'll see like division A, B, and then C's in parentheses. It doesn't matter to me how many A's, B's, and C's you have as long as you have at least an A and a B. You got to have at least an A and a B. So three main points. Each one needs at least an A and a B sub point. If you want more sub points than that, you go for it. Um, it really is going to depend on how in depth you're going and maybe just in the way your brain works. So some people will just use A and B and they'll cover a lot of ground in A and B. Other people would cover the same amount of information, but they may have, you know, A through G just because they like to itemize it out a little bit more. So it's clear for them as the speaker. Either way is fine, but three main points, two sub points for each one. Now, the next thing you'll see here under each one of these main points is evidence slash supporting material. So in the speech itself, in the delivery, you're going to say, according to, then you're going to give us the publication day or publication name and date of your source. So according to a 2020 CNN article, according to uh, a 2021 article from the Journal of Speech, we'll call it, um, that's what you're going to say here. But this text box or, or section is designed just for you to put your sources there so that you can remember what they are and which ones go with which main points because you'll want to, again, cite them as you use them. Um, but having an evidence supporting material spot for each main point, you see them here, is just a good way to keep everything separated. I like to color code mine, and I'll show you that when we get to the demonstration, so stay tuned there. Um, the last thing I'll say about the body is when you're between the main points, you want transitions, and you'll see one here, and you see one here. For this one, between one and two, what you'll want to do is not simply say, next, we will talk about the thing, right? Instead, you will want to say, now that you understand main point one, whatever that name was, let's move on to main point two, whatever that name is. So I'm just looking around the room, pencils and pens. Now that you understand more about pencils, let's move on and talk about pens. Then when you get down to the next one there, you might say things like, boy, I'm really stretching for my materials here. I should have a Sharpie. I always have a Sharpie pretty close by. There's one. So this one, you wouldn't just say, now that we've talked about pins, let's talk about Sharpies. No, no. Go back to the beginning. So for this transition between main points two and three, say... Now that you know about both pencils and we have talked about pens, we can finish up as I drop mine and talk about Sharpies. So it's a, now that we've done this, let's move to that. Now that we've done this and this, let's move to that. And again, that is built in redundancy for your audience to follow along with your main points and to keep things in order mentally. Uh, but that is exactly what you would want to do for your, your main point transitions. Okay, we're down to the conclusion, and it's nice because the conclusion and the introduction are extremely similar. In fact, once you've done one, you basically have the other. So, what's in here? Review the statement of purpose. Review the thesis statement. Review the main points and closure. So, we remember at the top that we had the thesis statement, or I'm sorry, the statement of purpose, by the end of this speech, you should know more about 
writing utensils, we'll say. Then down here, it would just be the opposite sort of, by the end, it should be after hearing this speech. You should now know more about writing utensils. Done. Review the statement of purpose. We're going to do that at the end, but it will be the same at top as it is at the bottom. There's your main points. You're going to say again, today we discussed pencils, pens, and Sharpies. And then the closure, whatever you did for that attention getter, bring it back down, plug it in. Let's think about it differently or finish the story. Now for the central idea, because that is the last thing we need. It is really a one sentence summary of your whole message without any lists. And it's not a long sentence. Don't use, you know, 14 commas and two semicolons. In fact, the way I like to think of this is sort of um, the way they do it for movies. Let me go over here for just a second and I'll put in IMDb. So a movie that most people have seen, Finding Nemo, put that in. And what we'll find here is that movie is almost 20 years old already. Wow. Um, here, after his son is captured in the Great Barrier Reef and taken to Sydney, a timid clownfish sets out on a journey to bring him home. That is the thesis of Finding Nemo. Every movie on here is going to have one of those. And if you ever watch movies on cable, if you hit info, that's what pops up at the bottom. Now, if you've seen the movie, you understand that this doesn't have a lot of detail. And if you haven't, spoiler alert, come in here. So it doesn't say anything about even the name Nemo. It doesn't talk about Dory. It doesn't talk about the sharks or the jellyfish or the dentist's office with the crazy little girl in there. I mean, it's just there's lots of different things that could have been included but aren't. And that's because it doesn't need to give everything away. It summarizes in a very succinct way the entire film. It doesn't need all that detail because we're going to come to the detail in the body of the speech. So whenever you get that, put it up here, right? So for this one, if this is writing utensils, I might say writing utensils are, writing utensils come in a variety of forms, okay? Then down here, I would just simply say, after hearing this speech, you should know more about writing utensils. Then clearly writing utensils come in a variety of forms. Specifically today, we talked about pens or pencils, pens, and Sharpies. And then I can finish my speech. OK, so that is the outline sort of in a quick how to version. What we'll do next is, again, take this blank outline and I'm going to go ahead and copy it and move it over to a blank document so that we can then pick a topic and run with it a little bit further. OK, stay tuned for just a moment. I'm going to turn this off and then I'll start a new video, which will just be about doing this. Um, but before I do that, kind of crucial, I should talk to you about your evaluation form. Um, notice here that most of this, at least the first four things, are going to come from that outline. Selected and narrowed a topic according or appropriately. Well, you've already selected a topic. Now, if you narrow it a little bit more, you should get full credit here. Organization is clear. <clears throat> Follow the outline. Look at this. Attention getter, statement of purpose, thesis, relevance, transition or main points one, two, and three, transitions one, two, and three, statement of purpose in the close in the conclusion, thesis, review and closure, and then C two A is call to action. That's only for the persuasive speeches. So everything there is from the outline. Provides appropriate supporting material, so your sources, including publication and date. If you've got those, you should be good there. You're going to put them in your outline. Uses appropriate language to the audience. That's something you can plan out. Now, the vocal fillers start to bleed over into delivery. Those are the ums, uhs, likes, and you knows. And then we move a little bit more into just delivery. So a variety of rate, pitch, and pause, clear pronunciation and grammar, uh, adequate volume, conversational style, movement, gesture, posture, Eye contact, that's camera contact here, we know. Um, and then the time, did you stay within the time limits? Or if there's a PowerPoint for the very last speech, that'll also be factored in there. Now, if you go over, you'll see that each of these has a range uh, from poor to excellent. Or if you think of it this way, poor is zero points, fair is one, good two, very good three, and excellent four. So that means that if there are eight items with a total of four points each, 
your grade is something out of 32. So what I would do then is put in you know, like 24 out of 32, divide that out to a percentage, and then give you your score out of whatever this one's worth, 15 points, 20 points, 25 points. And that's how your grading will work. I do always curve um, this individual assignment, every speech. So whoever makes the tightest or the highest grade, um, I will bump them up to uh, either a full A if nobody makes a full A or 100% if they do make a full A. And then I add that same amount of points to everyone's grade. There's no bell curve, it's just a straight curve. I know that sounds strange, straight curve. But that is the deal. So make sure that you're looking over all of this, that you're familiar with how to use it and that you've got it turned in by the end of this week. And again, like I said, I will do a demo for you in just a moment. Um, as you practice, the last thing I'll say, get that evaluation form, record yourself and watch it back and use that form to see how you're doing. All right, more momentarily with the demo, but for now, I'll see you soon.